Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. I am warm-heartedly greeting everyone at this very representative event. 400 companies, out of which 70 are partner countries, and this is a big group of those who are involved in the most important economic area globally, which is energy. And today is part of the print recession, which is the energy for the global growth. We're going to talk about the defining key issues about what tomorrow the global energy will look like. What are the priority issues that we will together have to deal with in order to ensure the reliable supply of energy to the biggest macro regions of the planet and each individual country separately. And on this basis, improve the competitiveness of the national economies, improve the quality of life for the millions of people. I would like to define those most important trends which, in our view, will define the general energy future for the whole humanity. It is obvious that the general picture of the new energy will change. As deemed by the experts already in 20 years' time, the humankind will require by 30% more energy than today. And this is related to the development of the global economy, the growth of the population on the planet, the improvement of the quality of life, and the level of consumption, particularly in the emerging countries. I shall remind us that today, based on the statistics, up to 2 billion people on this planet yet do not have full access to the sources of energy. Without doubt, the forthcoming decade will see the situation change, which will bring about the development of the new markets, the geography and the structure of the energy demand, first of all, will shift towards the Asia-Pacific. Further on, today, in the energy community, there is a heated debate going on about what the energy mix in the 21st century will look like. And the majority are of the opinion that the leading place in it within the next 20, 25 years will be played by the hydrocarbons, particularly in the environment when a number of countries voluntarily restrict the development of the nuclear generation. Alongside with that, one should expect the growth of the fuel competition and in the first place between the conventional and the new sources of energy. Today, practically all of the mature economies set the course for the development of the clean energy, including the renewables, which account already for more than half of all of the commission generation capacities. By 2035, their share in the global energy mix is expected to grow from 15 to 23% while in power generation, and that is not taking into account a hydro energy from the current 7 to 20 percent. However, the traditional conventional energy is not going to stand still. For example, the improvement of the exploration and production technologies makes the tight to recover reserves of oil and gas more easily recoverable, which applies also to the energy potential of the Arctic. Another key trend will become the reduction of the energy intensity of the economies in the first place through the massive application of the modern technologies, which can be easily seen through the example of the internal combustion engine. Whereas just 20 years ago, an automobile would consume per 100 kilometers on average 12.2 liters of gasoline. Today, it is 8.5 liters of gasoline, almost one third less, which is 31 percent. Another very important trend is digitalization of the energy industry. Very fast processing of colossal amounts of data and the artificial intellect, the implementation of the smart energy grids will enable one to systemically analyze the production and consumption of energy and longer term considerably reduce the cost of the production of energy resources, improve the efficiency of their uh, implication and reduce losses. Another very obvious trend is the improvement of the accessibility of energy resources and the energy infrastructure in general. We are witnessing the integration of the regional markets and the traditional logistical chains see the new routes of energy supplies fit into them. I mean also, amongst other things, the North Sea route and the Silk route and the flexible market of LNG is developing. For example, the current number of the consumers of the liquefied natural gas is twice more than just about 10 years ago. 
So all of the above mentioned trends will further strengthen the link between the producers and consumers and will lead to further globalization of the markets, the growth of the energy interdependence between different parts of the planet. Dear colleagues, Russia is one among leading energy powers, understands its role and its responsibility for ensuring sustainability and the development of global energy. Our country exports energy resources to dozens of countries of the world, and it has demonstrated its status of a reliable and stable partner on many occasions. We carefully study and take into account trends in global energy. Over the recent years, environment has been set up in Russia for substantial investments into the development of new technologies, into increasing the local content of manufacturing our equipment and increasing added value. All of it increased competitiveness of our domestic fuel and energy complex on the international arena. Today, we are upgrading oil refineries, setting up large-scale gas and petrochemistry Production. I'm referring to the clusters of Amur and Tobolsk, Eastern Petrochemical Company. Great attention is attached to this area in other regions of the Russian Federation, as the tradition goes, in Tatarstan. Projects are being promoted, which advance the development of infrastructure and diversification of exports. For example, Yamal LNG gas pipeline, such as Nord Stream 1, that has been built. And now, right now, we're working on the construction of the Nord Stream 2. The Turkish Stream is being constructed, as well as the power of Siberia. All of it is of key importance for the whole Eurasian continent. The capacity of the pipeline East Siberia Pacific Ocean is being stepped up. Let me stress, all of it, all of it is highly technological, modern projects. And it is of particular importance that foreign partners are engaged in these projects, which once again attests to the competitiveness of our fuel and energy complex, its attractiveness for strategic capital investments. As other countries of the world, we seek to make energy cleaner and we have attained significant results. Let me stress that already today, among the biggest economies of the world, Russia's energy mix is one of the cleanest. Over a third of generation is accounted for by nuclear power and hydro energy and renewable energy sources. Another 50% is the share of gas, the usage of which helps us significantly mitigate emissions and other impact on the environment. That is why we're so bold in getting committed uh, to the Paris Climate Agreement. In other words, clean energy sources in our country altogether account for around 84% from general generation volumes, and by 2035, this share is going to increase by almost 90%. As Russia's energy mix evolves, domestic oil consumption is going to decrease, and the ways to use and utilize coal will become more environmentally friendly. In compliance with the energy strategy of Russia in the upcoming two decades, electricity production from renewable energy sources is going to increase exponentially. Besides, their development would contribute to developing expertise for the global energy of the future, for the localization and the development of our own technologies. Let me stress that we are using efficient investment support mechanisms in generation based on renewable energy sources, which guarantee return of investments. We will continue promoting capital investments in this field, including of our foreign companies and partners. I have mentioned that contrary to other countries, Russia does not give up the development of clean and safe nuclear power. Besides, Rosatom has become one of the leaders at the global nuclear power market. Today, its portfolio includes bids for the construction of 34 energy units abroad. As we increase, increase energy efficiency, we plan to reduce GDP energy intensity by one time and a half by 2035. That will happen as a result of structural readjustment of economy, reduction of losses in the grids and the deployment of energy saving technologies, digital technologies, the reduction of, of specific fuel consumption in transport and power generation. Our energy is future oriented and future belongs to innovations. That is why we attach great importance to scientific research 
design and development in the energy field. We are setting up favorable conditions to attract private investments into promising projects. A good example could be the extension of production of modern solar panels based on domestic technologies as well as equipment for wind generation. Dear colleagues, today's opportunities and objective problems in the energy field dictate our the need of joint efforts as we advance to the future. We would like to jointly remove obstacles to further economic growth of countries. First of all, I'm referring to developing countries which need guaranteed and affordable access to electricity and energy. However, there are many other trends offsetting the movement towards global energy partnership. I'm referring to unilateral financial and sectoral sanctions in the energy sector, which are directly used by certain, certain countries and partners for unfair competition, for asserting their own interests and their own energy resources, even despite the fact that they're uncompetitive. The negative impact of such steps is obvious for the whole world energy sector and economy. It is, first of all, a severe blow to consumers and those countries who, welcoming such actions, miss attractive investment opportunities. Of great danger for world energy sector is a growing technological gap. For example, two-thirds of high-technology oil services in the world are rendered only by three companies representing developed countries. Today, we need to consistently remove barriers to free movement of energy sources, investments into their production and development. We need to actively develop energy infrastructure jointly foster new technologies. Let me stress that we stand ready to cooperate in the energy field with all interested partners based on principles of equality and mutual benefit. Of great, great importance is attached to our cooperation within the framework of such reputable structures as BRICS, Eurasian Economic Union, SEO, OPEC, and Gas Exporting Countries Forum. A good example of successful joint efforts is the agreement between Russia and some other countries with OPEC. Not only have we ensured the oil market rebalancing, we have opened up new opportunities to implement prom promising projects and technological cooperation because investments got back into this sector. I'm confident that we'll continue to get united in creating a sustainable and fa fair energy future. I wish all the participants of the Russian Energy Week fruitful work and interesting discussions. Thank you for your attention. President Putin, thank you, uh, th thank you very much uh, for those uh, opening words. I think they very eloquently um, express the, the full range of the, the themes and, 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 and the topics uh, that we that we want to talk about um, today at, at this uh, at this forum. Let me first introduce our, our, our illustrious panel. Uh, my name is uh, John Fraher. I'm a senior executive editor um, at Bloomberg News. Uh, t to my left is Mr. S um, Syed Mohammed Hussain Adeli, secretary G secretary general of the Gas. Exporting Countries Forum. We, of course, have, of course, delighted uh, to welcome our host, uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, to his left is the Secretary General of OPEC, Mohamed Sanusi uh, Barkindo. Uh, and to his left, then, is uh, Adnan Amim, the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency. Thank you very much all uh, for joining us. Um, President Putin, let me, let me um, begin with you. Um, you mentioned um, Russia's alliance or the a recent agreement with, with OPEC, and you mentioned the fact that it opens up uh, new opportunities uh, for Russia. Um, as you know, uh, there is a lot of talk about uh, whether Russia and OPEC will extend the, these production cuts, which are, are due to expire um, at the end of March. Um, would you consider extending them beyond the end of March? I mentioned it in slightly different words. I said that it creates an opportunity to invest into the global energy industry because we see the recovery of investment process into energy after prices stabilize. Let me remind us that in 2016, when towards the end of the year we were trying to reach an agreement about this joint action, 
there was um, a surplus in the market, uh, production was greater than consumption, then the reserves uh, were near a critical margin, and it all led to a dramatic reduction of prices um, for energy resources and for oil in the first place. And so in the end of 2016, we were able to agree upon our joint um, action plan, and actually we were able to reduce. In Russia and practically all of the countries are standing true uh, to these commitments uh, by almost 103% in the beginning. Uh, Russia took on the commitment to reduce uh, uh, 300,000 uh, barrels a day, and that is exactly what we did. We uh, are completely uh, compliant. Uh, with these kind of commitments, and as you correctly noted, later on we agreed about extending for another nine months until March 2018. And in what we see currently happening, I think everybody is interested, not only the oil producers, but also the consumers. Why? Because when the price for oil fell below the lower threshold, if I may say so, investment stopped flowing into the industry and that meant that sooner or later there will come a day when the global energy and the global economy will invariably be confronted by a very dramatic and unexpected shortage of energy resources and the prices would have been rebounded sky high and nobody is interested in that are they everybody is interested in the market being stable and so what we were able to do together with opac I believe, is uh, for the benefit of the whole global economy. Now, whether we're going to extend this agreement or not will depend upon the way the situation would evolve in the global market. So, principally, I am not ruling this out, but we are going to act upon the realities that would evolve by March 2018. A little bit to me like you would perhaps be in favor of extending them beyond March. Of course, the, the end of March is not very far away. I think that this is possible. You know, and you know this uh, quite well. It is very important to entertain caution in uh, such a public forum and public statement because many countries who didn't join us, they are quite positive respond to what we're doing today in reducing our production. For example, the Libyan leadership, to the extent I heard, publicly stated recently that it is considering the possibility of uh, having the Libyan producers join our efforts um, in at least uh, the part which is being controlled by the powers which have made such a statement. I mean, Marshal Haftar, for example. And everybody is aware of this and understand the need for such joint effort. I shall repeat it again. We will have to look again at the way the global energy mix looked like say, in March 2018. We maintain contacts with our key partners, with OPEC in general, and with main producer nations. And so I hope for that we will have the honor and the pleasure to receive the king of the Saudi Arabia very soon in Russia. And undoubtedly, we're going to talk about it. So we are maintaining this constant dialogue and I shall repeat it, based upon the realities. In March 2018, we will make our decision, but I do not rule out that we may extend these agreements. I'll push you on this on, on, on one, uh, one last question on this. Um, everyone in this room, of course, um, likes stability. Everyone in markets likes stability. Um, if you were to continue to, start to, to decide to continue the uh, production cuts, do you, could you see that the extension of cuts lasting until the end of next year? Well, I'm saying that we don't know yet whether we are going to extend or not, and the question is being asked until when we're going to extend it. Well, I mean, once we decide to extend or not to extend, that is when we're going to decide on the time frame. But overall, speaking about the possible extension as a minimum towards the end of 2018. Okay. Let me just talk one final question I'll, I'll to talk a little bit more generally. You've, you've always said that Russia would never join OPEC. Has this, has the, the success of this agreement changed your mind on that? Is it something you would think about again? No, it hasn't changed my state of mind towards it, particularly as all uh, see and as all analysts uh, 
note, even the fact of us not being inside OPAC enables us to effectively coordinate our joint work. To bind us by a certain administrative restriction is something that we believe is unnecessary, but we shall continue to work with the OPEC countries and with the major producers, not simply on voluntary, but upon mutually beneficial basis. When we were agreeing about who and by how much and within which period of time is supposed to cut production, that was a difficult process because everybody was looking at what kind of a level of output uh, different countries had by different point in time from which period of time individual countries are supposed to cut. That was not a simple job. We were ready to meet each other halfway and we did that and our partners acted in the same token for the interests of stabilizing the global energy market. We do have a positive experience and that is what we're going to rely upon. Um, Mr. Prakindo, let, let me um, turn to you. I mean, the oil market does look healthy right now. Prices have rallied and, and global inventories are falling. Do you feel right now that the deal with Russia should be extended? Uh, thank you very much, John. And let me begin by uh, thanking the Russian authorities uh, under the able leadership of uh, President Vladimir Putin for putting together this uh, premier event uh, at a very timely uh, uh, situation that we are in today, and to thank them for uh, inviting OPEC uh, to participate. I had listened attentively to the very comprehensive uh, address of uh, President Putin, which has covered the entire energy uh, spectrum, and to the very apt answers that he responded to your very pointed questions. I would like to use this opportunity to, on behalf of OPEC, uh, to really thank the President and his government and his very able uh, Minister Alexander Novak for the role they played uh, in the run-up to these historic decisions that we reached uh, last year. The declaration of cooperation that we agreed on on the 10th of December last year, as the President just referred to, was very historic. And the work that went into it was very strenuous, very challenging. Uh, but thanks to Alexander Novak and his colleagues in OPEC, uh, uh, the President of the conference, uh, Mohamed Sada of Qatar, who is here with us today, and uh, Bijan Zangane Del Pino of Venezuela, we all rallied together, despite the fact that uh, Russia is not a bona fide member of OPEC, but they took a very leadership role uh, in ensuring that we had this consensus, uh, not only within OPEC, but between OPEC and non-OPEC, in order to restore stability uh, to this market. The President had made reference in his speech about stability. The issue is about stability without stability that had eluded the oil market in the last two, three years we can all see the consequences on investments that the President has referred to. Uh, investments in this industry had contracted uh, in the last two, three years, cumulatively over 40 percent, threatening uh, future supplies. And we all have a shared responsibility, whether OPEC or Russia, uh, to ensure a security of future supplies. Uh, we are reliable and dependable suppliers of oil uh, to the world consuming markets, not only now, but for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I want to reiterate uh, the vision of the Declaration of Cooperation and also state here that uh, all the participating countries uh, have been abiding and implementing uh, their own obligations fully. Uh, for the first time in history, uh, we are having a joint effort where conformity uh, to these obligations has been extremely well, very high. Uh, Russia has played its part. Uh, it's uh, actually uh, implementing over 100 percent of its obligations, particularly in the last two months. Uh, so we are all on course, and as the President has just said, the fundamentals will decide uh, in March of next year whether we have been able to achieve our objectives of rebalancing the market. One variable, stocks in the equation, 
has been out of balance since the fall of 2014. And it was a collective decision of Russia and OPEC that in order to balance this equation, we had to address this variable of stocks to bring it down, to help the market, to bring it down to the five-year average. And we are on course. From January to date, we have seen stock drawdown of nearly 170 million barrels. So there is massive destocking that is taking place across the spectrum, across regions, both onshore and offshore. And I am confident under this platform that we have created, uh, thanks to President Putin and Alexander Novak and uh, the ministers in OPEC, we will be able to restore stability on a sustainable basis uh, to this industry. Thank you. Uh, and how quickly do you think you'll be able to get to that point? I mean, this, this restoring of stability, or is that happening more quickly than you would have anticipated maybe three months ago? As you have seen, when we started, these talks have built up to over nearly 380 million barrels over the five-year average, and this was unprecedented in the history of oil. But as a result of the full implementation of the Declaration of Cooperation, from January to date, we have been able to stimulate the drawdown uh, to about 168 million barrels. Uh, the latest numbers are showing. Therefore, we are on course. The drawdown is ongoing. The market is rebalancing uh, going forward. And without preempting uh, what uh, Alexander Novak and uh, his colleagues, the ministers, will decide on November the 30th. I think the fundamentals that will be presented to them at that time, as President Putin has just referred to, will inform the decision that they will uh, eventually take uh, on going forward. But all I can say is that the future is looking much brighter uh, than before uh, this decision was taken on the, on the 10th of December. And we are looking at beyond the rebalancing of this market uh, to further institutionalize this strategic partnership between OPEC and the non-OPEC uh, through the Russian Federation so that we will be able to uh, sustain the level of cooperation beyond the issue of supply and demand and stocks. And could you, just finally on that topic, could you give us a sense of what is the mood among the OPEC members? You obviously talk to them all the time. What is the, what is the current balance of opinion um, in OPEC as regards extending production cuts next year? I think there is, there is, there is a, a, a common understanding not only within OPEC, but the international oil markets, that for the first time we have got our act together. Mm. Uh, for the first time we have shown and demonstrated our commitment of 24 producing countries uh, to take full responsibility in restoring stability to this uh, market. And we have also demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that we are committed in sustaining this beyond the rebalancing of the market. The market in the fullness of time based on the figures that are before us now will rebalance, will come back to balance and the equilibrium will be restored. But what happened the morning after? Uh, now discussions are ongoing uh, among uh, my ministers in OPEC uh, together with Alexander Novak and his colleagues in the non-OPEC group on how best we can institutionalize this partnership so that we can begin to address issues like investments that the President has just uh, referred to. Without sustained investments in this industry in a predictable manner, uh, we may be sowing the seeds of future shortages of energy, which is not in the interest of either producers and consumers. What we have done is not only in the interest of producers, but also in the interest of consumers, as President Putin has uh, aptly described. Thank you for that. Um, let's shift gears now and turn to the future um, of, of the energy industry. So governments around the world are throwing their weight behind fighting climate change, regardless of what Donald Trump and, and the US thinks about Paris. 
uh, transport is becoming more fuel efficient and electric cars, self-driving cars, uh, may transform our societies in a way that are as yet uh, impossible to predict. Despite all this, a lot of oil producers say that the industry has still got decades of growth um, ahead of it um, as it tries to feed the needs of the world's emerging middle classes. But Mr. Emin, mean, you, you, you represent the world's uh, renewable, uh, you, you represent the renewables industry here in this panel. Do you think, are those predictions wrong? Is there too much complacency when, do you find too much complacency when you come to conferences like this full of representatives of the energy establishment? It's a very interesting question, but let me start by saying how privileged I feel to be here and to have somebody from renewables on the same stage with the leader from a leading energy country and two leaders from the hydrocarbons is an indication of how this change is taking place. You wouldn't have expected this a year ago. So that's the first indicator. But in a broader sense, if you look at the pulse of what is happening, I had the privilege of listening to President Putin three times this year. First was in Istanbul at the World Energy Congress when President Putin said, you know, the advent of green energy is moving fast and it is the right development for the world for the future. In St. Petersburg, I was there, I listened to him and when he said that we are reaching limits of sustainability and we need to find a new paradigm for development for the future based on more sustainable energy. And today, placing the whole energy discussion in the broader landscape of global affairs and how this is happening. And I think that what I'm hearing from a very visionary leader of a leading energy country in the world is that he sees the world of energy changing quite fast beyond what we expected. And I think this is what we see from the perspective of renewables. Now, you mentioned some of those trends, but let me just give you a sense of what's happening and the fact that this is such a disruptive force that we are seeing is that the bulk of new capacity addition in the power sector, and I think we need to segment how energy is used to analyze it properly, but the bulk of investment and capacity in the global power sector, the majority in the last four years has been from renewable energy, and last year added capacity was 62% from renewables. What we're seeing is that the business case for renewables in power generation in different countries and you cannot generalize among countries because every country has a very specific resource endowment. But in general, across the world, the cost of renewables has come down dramatically. The technology to integrate renewables in a reliable way in electricity systems has advanced incredibly fast. And now we are seeing the advent, not just talking about capacity addition, but talking about system transformation, how systems of electricity in the future are going to look how they're going to be based on clean energy generation and how the cost of clean gener uh, energy generation has come down so fast. Uh, just to give you some examples, solar PV has decreased, technology has decreased in cost by 80% in the last seven years. The cost of uh, onshore wind has decreased well, 60%. And we are projecting from our research, looking at all the different sources, that this trend is going to continue into the next 10 years and when you look at the cost of generation from some of the new projects, we are seeing wind and solar projects coming in at three US dollar cents a kilowatt hour around the world. This is a remarkable new development. And yesterday was the most shocking news is that the bid for 300 megawatts of solar generation in Saudi Arabia by Mustard in Abu Dhabi has been made at 1.7 US dollar cents a kilowatt hour. Now, I'm not saying that the solar endowment in the Russian Federation is the same as in Saudi Arabia, clearly not, but what I'm saying is that the general trend of cost is coming to a point where we can expect transformative change to take place on the business side. But on your last point, in terms of what does this mean for the system, I was with the CEOs of all the major European utilities yesterday morning in Amsterdam to discuss the implications for them. They have gone through a very traumatic restructuring of their industry because they have now to deal with the advent of new technology, digitalization of energy, demand response from renewables in ways that we had not imagined, and the fact that the renewables mix in Europe is now moving so incredibly fast that traditional utilities have to move to service models and have to change their business model. 
I think that this trend is something that will become global in a very short period of time. If you start to look at India and China and the ambition on renewables, if you look at the fact that in Africa and in Latin America, this has become the dominant form of capacity addition to the global electricity sector, on the power sector, I think the future is going to be largely renewable. The issue becomes what happens when you start to look at the future of oil. And of course, we, uh, renewables cannot compete yet on uh, mobility, transportation, freight, and other end use and industrial sectors. But the advent of uh, electric vehicles is going to be a game changer because we are now seeing countries like China, India, uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, Scandinavian countries, which are now committing to uh, electric mobility by 2030 or by 2040. When that begins to happen is when you will see real impacts in terms of demand for different types of hydrocarbon projects. Uh, I, I believe that you know, gas will continue to play a very important role because for the time being, you need some level of stability in systems and gas provides that quick response capability to balance intermittency from renewables and systems. Uh, but you know, demand for oil is very different from the demand you have for renewables. And there, I would, I would never predict what will happen with oil. I leave that to much wiser people to do. But, but nevertheless, do you feel there's too, still too much complacency? I, I do, and I think that what we haven't yet fully grasped is how quick this disruptive force is going to move. When you remember what happened very quickly with uh, IT and uh, mobile telephony, and the fact that the landline became obsolete in a very few years. We're now seeing new systems for power generation and distribution that are making the old fixed infrastructure of centralized generation and distribution obsolete. And when you have the advent uh, of storage, like in electric vehicles, you know, people normally use, an electric, uh, use a car two hours a day. But when you have an electric vehicle, you basically have a battery on wheels sitting in your garage, and if it's connected to the system, you have the storage capability with the one second response time that can help to balance systems. So I think electric mobility will move much faster than people are expecting. I think that will have very disruptive implications for uh, the energy uh, sector overall. And I think that we need to prepare because the advent of new technology and digitalization and blockchain is going to be transformative in the terms of how we uh, generate and distribute energy in the future. Mr. Hassan Adeli, let me let me turn to you. You're here representing um, the, the gas uh, the gas industry, and of course, we've heard a lot already about the important role that gas will play in the transition from from oil to uh, to more renewable, cleaner um, energy forms. And but yet, uh, there are concerns that we're about to face a long period um, of oversupply in the global LNG market, for example. Is it time to make the GEFC a bit more like OPEC and to start regulating production? Well, uh, le let me first uh, say how pleased I am to be in this honorable uh, panel with uh, His Excellency President Putin. Also, I would like to congratulate the Russian government under His Excellency's leadership for uh, this timely conference also, I would like to say that uh, today we are organizing our uh, 19th ministerial meeting under the presidency of uh, Russia, and Minister Novak is the president of the uh, ministerial meeting, and we are uh, discussing among uh, the ministers uh, developments of the, of the gas. But uh, talking about the uh, future of gas, I should say that although gas is uh, now facing some challenges, and that challenges is because of the changing dynamics of the market, but it, it has a, a promising future. Why? I think that there are four main reasons why gas has a promising future. First one, as you rightly mentioned, and it was also referred by President Putin, is the environmental agenda of the world. We have UN 2030 agenda. We have the uh, sustainable global uh, agenda. I mean, uh, Global uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDG, and we have the Paris Agreement. Uh, and all of these would uh, make the countries and energy policies to mitigate 
their CO2 emission, and they have already made some commitments. And I guess even in the United States, practically, that is not going to happen. In the state levels, there are many uh, uh, authorities over there which will uh, go into mitigating the CO2 energy. So mitigation of CO2 energy and advance to the low carbon society is a global movement which is going to uh, advance its own way. Uh, and this is one uh, factor, which is very important factor. The second factor is the flexibility of gas. Uh, flexibility of gas, by that, I mean that uh, uh, gas has become very competitive. We, we see that LNG is growing, also is giving lots of competitiveness to the, uh, to the uh, trade of gas, as well as uh, we see that uh, there are lots of uh, uh, flexibility in terms of uh, trade terms and conditions. So this makes uh, gas flexible and competitive. Even I think that although we hear about the cost of uh, uh, investment in the energy, in the renewable energy, is coming down, and I agree that the technology is helping really to come down, but still they cannot compete with the low cost production gas, which is uh, very much uh, uh, found in Middle East and CIS countries. Uh, therefore, the second is the flexibility and competitiveness. And the third, which is very interesting, is that, you know, gas has already a very rich infrastructure. So if a country would like to invest on that, instead of creating and investing a lot in other uh, fuels, I mean, gas has uh, already uh, lots of uh, investments which you can do all these investments on, on that. And last but not least, we are talking at the global level, and our solution should be a global solution. Solution for Africa, solution for Asia. It is not a Europe-centric solution. And that comes to the nature of gas, which is accessible, affordable, and abundant. Not as much as uh, is renewable. Renewable is great, but uh, to re rely on majority of the energy consumption of an African country on renewables, it is impossible getting the technology, obtaining all of these things. So this is why, although we uh, call it as a motto that gas is a triple A asset because of its abundant, accessible, and uh, affordable, but because of these four reasons, I see that gas is moving forward. Uh, according to all forecasters, including ourselves, GECF Outlook 2040 forecasts that the gas share in the energy mix is going to grow from what is now 22 uh, and a half to more than 26 percent. And this is, this is the fastest fossil fuel uh, growth of the energy. And uh, when we look at the other uh, uh, source of energies, for example, renewable, the renewable is going to increase in the next 25 years from what is now, of course, by renewable, I exclude the hydro. And uh, the renewable now, it is something around 12 or maybe 13 percent. When I say maybe, it is according to our outlook, 12 percent. According to the outlook of the other forecasters, is something more than that, 1 percent more than that. And this is going to increase to something around 16 percent. I mean, so in 25 years, we see that even the renew renewables would be something around 16, 17, or even according to IEA, 19 percent. So this is why we see that gas is going up. And there is one another reason which I would like to use uh, what Adnan said also uh, as something which uh, would add to the gas, and that is the growth of renewable. You know, the growth of renewable would add to the growth of gas. Why? Because renewables are intermittent, and they need the backup of gas. So this is why wherever you have uh, more renewables, you have to have a backup of gas in order to have the sustainability of the, of the production. So in yeah. general, yeah. we see it as a very promising. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, President Putin, let me, uh, let me return to you. You are meeting tomorrow with the, um, with the King of, of Saudi Arabia. 
Um, and of course, we've heard a lot from, from the Kingdom about their plans for a post-oil future, especially from, their, from the new Crown Prince, with whom I know you have um, a very good relationship. Is it time for Russia to develop its own plan for the future after fossil fuels, a plan that's um, as ambitious and as radical as what we're seeing in Saudi Arabia? If I may, a couple of words in commenting upon what you've just discussed. Here, our colleagues referred to one of very substantial components in relationship to the environment and the energy, which is electric cars. It is indeed a very environmentally friendly type of transportation. However, in order to connect oneself to the uh, electricity grid and charge your battery, you have to produce this uh, electricity for which you need to have a primary source. And today in the world, by way of such a number one primary source, it is not oil even, it's coal. And with this regard, one certainly has to move towards having the renewable sources of energy moving into the forefront in the generation systems. But that won't happen before the end of the next 30-year period. And for now, we do not know how this will happen because the technology of utilizing both coal and oil are improving. That is why the experts primarily say that the energy mix uh, will remain as it is today. And so, with this in mind, I would like to note that the kind of fuel as the gas motor fuel, we believe, in the end of the day, to be much more environmentally safe than the electric automobile, because, like I said, the primary source for the electricity generation currently to a very large extent comes from coal and fuel oil, gas just partially, while the gas motor fuel, if it is to be directly used in the transportation, then overall that should constitute the kind of the green energy then simply found in the electric cars only. Now, um, with respect to the LNG, uh, which you just uh, you know, mentioned in passing that, one observes a bit of a stagnation in the LNG market. And isn't it high time to uh, switch uh, over to the same kind of the regulation in the gas industry as is the case in the oil industry. Well, indeed, um, that uh, is uh, true that there is a bit of a stagnation in terms of the LNG utilization, and this we see through the European example where we observe the lowest capacity utilization amongst the LNG terminals. And on the contrary, the pipeline gas supplies has dramatically grew, and that shows that the competitiveness of LNG at this point in time is inferior to the pipeline gas. And I believe that gradually this will all change. And let me now start answering your question that you directed to me. But before I do that, um, I would like to respond to another uh, point that you've mentioned about this gas market, isn't it about time for it to become like the oil market? That will become possible, and that would make sense only when the gas market becomes global rather than regional, because today it is still regional. In how long could that take until uh, it becomes truly the global? Well, nobody knows, and I will explain why. Because let me say, in the Asia-Pacific, we see countries consume uh, the liquefied natural gas to a larger extent. In Europe, we see countries consume the pipeline gas to a larger extent. And when this level between the two will be equal and the smart market uh, will be 
more developed. And all of it will merge together. Then it will be the time for us to start talking about adopting the same kind of regulatory measures like we see in the oil market. Now, when will it happen? It is difficult to predict. But already today, these are the topics that we're thinking about. We're preparing ourselves for this. And undoubtedly, the production and transportation cost of LNG will be going down, but it is still too expensive. You have to produce gas, liquefy it, transport it, and then regasify it and uh, deliver it to a consumer. It's expensive, but we're preparing for this. You know, one of our biggest projects in this area is Yamal LNG, our biggest undertaking in the area of the gas energy. We do it together with foreign partners from China, Japan, from France. This is an international project, and we plan the development of an already existing LNG generation in the far east uh, on the Sahalin Island. We plan to increase the supplies of the liquefied natural gas to Asia-Pacific uh, countries and uh, to Western Europe. And this is all will be facilitated by the development of the Northern Sea Route. If we take a look at the time it takes and the cost involved in delivering the respective goods, including the LNG, let's uh, say the most well-developed uh, routes uh, are from Rotterdam to Yokohama, then the distance and the time it takes becomes one-third shorter and quicker and, uh, in the similar token, more attractive and more efficient and less costly. Understanding what is going on with the global climate, being aware of the fact that the navigation time extends, we are not expecting and uh, we're not waiting until the weather is going to be as good as in the Mediterranean. We are busy building the ice-breaking fleet, the kind that no other country has. Russia is the only country in the world which has such a powerful ice-breaking fleet. We are currently commissioning another ice-breaker by the name of Sibir, and it will be able to break the ice of uh, the three-meter thickness, and two more icebreakers like that are currently uh, in the shipyards, and in a few years' time, we're planning to commission the kind of an icebreaker which will be able to break any ice. So what we're trying to achieve is to help the gas market become global, and that is what we're preparing for. But we are similarly preparing ourselves to work with the renewable sources of energy. And in my brief presentation, I uh, mentioned uh, that, for example, we develop the competency in producing the solar panels. We are developing this uh, industry, and uh, moreover, uh, in as far as this is concerned, the products which are being produced in the Russian Federation, and that is already acknowledged by uh, many, our solar panels are much more competitive than the similar kind of products which are being produced by traditional producers. And uh, without doubt, we are thinking both on practical terms, we are going to also run hydrogen energy projects. Uh, and we do have the capacity to develop the kind of energy related to the wind um, uh, uh, loads, particularly in some of the Russian remote regions, like in the Far East. We have a huge and vast territory where this kind of a generation can feed whole regions in this country. So we're preparing ourselves for this, not just like Saudi Arabia, but like many other countries do. And that is why I am confident that this country, Russia, won't be taken aback by any unexpected things. Can I just ask um, very quickly, I'd, like, I'd love to move on to um, foreign policy in the Middle East in a minute, but I'd just like to get back to something that you said about electric cars. Um, we all know, I think everyone in this room knows how much of a car fan you are. We've seen you driving a combine harvester. We've seen you flying a fighter jet. We've seen you, even seen you flying a glider. When will we see you driving an electric car? Could you ever imagine buying one yourself? 
да, конечно, могу себе представить. Yes, I certainly can imagine that, and definitely I will uh, put it in my declaration. Uh, and uh, I would like to address uh, those who are scrutinizing my uh, material status because I had an opportunity to drive an electric car and the uh, Russian uh, manufacturers who are dreaming to produce electric cars showed me them and I am familiar with uh, American electric cars, Asian electric cars specifically, uh, with the Japanese cars, so I tried driving all of them. I've been shown them and I was given a chance to uh, sit behind the wheel. And I must admit that I do like such cars, particularly uh, the modern cars, which are very fast, uh, very sprightly, and um, mm, for the city environment, that constitutes a very good uh, type of transportation because where you have a lot of people living, you need to uh, avoid uh, the exhaust. But I believe, in the end of the day, I mean, t right now, a much more environmentally friendly kind of a fuel and a transportation is gas-driven cars. But could we, could we imagine you one day uh, driving one of Elon Musk's Teslas? Why not? We are open to uh, such products and we are buying and uh, we are buying everything that we see useful and we sell everything that we find beneficial to sell. So there is nothing particular in it. And then what do you think? Are we going to just drive a horse-driven cart? No, we're no longer doing that. Or just tanks? No, no, not at all. T tanks are a good thing. So, so, so let me now turn to foreign policy and the Middle East, which is, of course, a region of, of great importance for energy, uh, for energy markets. Um, in many ways, you have become, over the last few years, one of the most uh, important players in the Middle East. Um, in fact, Bloomberg wrote a story yesterday that are arguing that it's very difficult to get anything done in the Middle East these days without going through uh, President Putin. But of course, I also know that you're a keen student of history and the Middle East, historically speaking, is a dangerous place uh, to, to do business and, and to play politics. So I'd like to sort of talk through some scenarios and so I'd like to talk through some of the particular situations um, in the middle, middle East and get your insights um, into how you see them. So, so let's start with uh, Saudi Arabia. As we said, the king, of, the king of, of, of Saudi Arabia is coming tomorrow. Saudi Arabia, we hear this week, in fact, is investing. There are lots of deals in the pipeline. Saudi is investing a lot of um, big money in Russia. We have the OPEC deal that, we just, that we've been talking about. And of course, you have often stated your admiration uh, for the new Saudi crown prince. But let's face it, Saudi's major ally is always going to be the United States when it, when, when it comes to its geopolitical interests. Do you worry that the Saudis are using you? You said always will remain. Is there anything in the world which is so absolutely constant? You know, I believe on the country, everything is ever so changing. In as far as um, the fact that some countries and our partners are pursuing their independent foreign policies, this is an absolutely natural thing. And whenever we are developing our relations with any other country, we are aware of it, we understand it, and we take this into account. And that is in no way for us to develop our relationship with such nations. Moreover, I should say that back in the Soviet times, our um, capacities were somewhat limited because of various ideological stereotypes and perceptions. And uh, a certain ideological Soviet to stick in the mud kind of an approach. We no longer have that. We are open to cooperation and our partners are witnessing this. And as far as the Saudi Arabia is concerned, several decades ago, we had relationships, but very much on the surface. So right now they have changed dramatically. We do have certain opposing views and different understanding about how various problems could be more effectively dealt with. But you know what is our advantage, and not only in our relations with Saudi Arabia, but with many other regional nations? Well, well you can take it or not take it from me. And you can ask our partners as well. 
our advantage is that we never play any double games with anybody. We are always honest and straightforward in our relation with our partners. We openly state our position. If we disagree with something, we state it outright that our position on this is so and so. We accept and respect your position and we take it into, into account, but we will act in this way. And that is our great advantage because we are predictable as opposed to many other countries. And that is exactly, I believe, rather than our defense potential, is what attracts our partners to develop relations with Russia. Well, certainly, it is uh, something uh, that is given that uh, defense potential um, sometimes plays a decisive uh, role, but not only our uh, growing opportunities and uh, capabilities in the defense area, not only the potential that is growing in our defense industry, in which traditionally are selling a lot of material and uh, defense equipment uh, into the Middle East, because with many regional countries, we've enjoyed historically very in-depth friendly relations, but we're also developing economic kind of cooperation with them. Um, um, uh, during the recent years uh, from the Middle Eastern uh, region, even despite the economic uh, difficulties that we uh, have been encountering, started uh, encountering two or three years ago, our trade turnover has been growing. I believe that last year it uh, grew by about 12.5 percent. This year, approximately by the same margin, just uh, during the first half of the year, which means that uh, the annual results are going to be even better. And at the same time, the trade, bilateral trade, is well diversified because these are the countries which are producing energy resources themselves. And that is why a considerable amount, a considerable share in our trade relations uh, is accounted for by machinery and equipment, by the high tech products. And I shall repeat, the volumes of the products that we are selling is growing. And so currently, when, because of a short-sighted policy by some of the countries when we had to respond to the sanctions that have been forced upon us. The market for farming products for many countries in the Middle East uh, uh, have become vacant, and so they are making an opportunity out of it and are developing the cooperation in the agriculture with us. So we do enjoy a very good potential, and we are looking into the future with confidence both as far as the Saudi-Russian relations are concerned, as well as the Russian regional and other countries' relations like Egypt, like Jordan, like Israel, um, and with Syria, without doubt. And, uh, well, Turkey is not directly um, uh, part of the Middle Eastern uh, region, but nevertheless, with Turkey, with Iran, we've traditionally been having good partner relationships. And these kind of relationships are well balanced. And I am sure that this will help us in developing such relations in the future as well. One of the, one of the countries, of course, where it's going to be most difficult to balance all of those relationships, I'm sure, will be in Syria. Um, things, you know, it is looking like we're perhaps closer to the end of, the, of that horrible um, conflict than we, than we are at the beginning. Uh, but of course, there are lots of different views of what the future of Syria should look like. Now, again, as I said earlier, you have, you're, have an increasingly close relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia. But of course, they are not very happy about the, the influence that Iran has in Syria. What sort of role do you see for Iran in a, in a, in a post, in a post, what sort of role do you see for Iran in Syria in a post-war world? And you know, will you, could, would you, could you guarantee to the Saudis that all Iranian forces and militia will leave Syria after the conflict? We do not have the authority or the right to define the path or the road that any country should follow. This is the sovereign right of every people of every country, and that fully attributes to Iran. We've been always respectful towards the sovereignty and the policy decisions of any country. Iran is our neighbor, is our longtime partner. We value this, uh, and we are very much respectful of the national interests of Iran. But uh, 
Not only Iran has national interests, uh, Russia has them, Turkey and the Saudi Arabia does have them. So we are aware of various concerns and counter concerns that uh, the countries have. Currently, everybody is uh, worried about the way the situation is going to develop in Iraq uh, with uh, the referendum recently, which uh, has taken place in Kurdistan. So you find a lot of internal regional problems there. So if you try and tune yourself to looking for compromises and the kind of decisions which are acceptable to all of the stakeholders, then the situation becomes more stable. Well, look, you um, definitely have heard a lot about the de-escalation zones. Despite all of the difficult differences in approaches, we've been able, as the result of a very intricate, very laborious, in full sense of it, effort involving all of the participants, we were able to agree to establish such a zone in the south, taking into account the interests of Israel and Jordan and the United States, uh, uh, the Iranians. We were able to agree upon the de-escalation zones in Iglip, taking into account the Turkish and Iranian interests in Syria as well in the first and the second cases. And so I am confident that we will be eventually able to effectively complete the work that uh, we have to do to relieve everybody of uh, the uh, Daesh and uh, similars like that, because you have to focus not upon what is the subject matter of the dispute, but what is the subject matter of common interests, and then success is guaranteed. Um, let me turn, um, you, you mentioned it a, a moment ago, let me turn to the Kurdistan and the Kurdistan referendum. Um, Russia, I believe, is the only major power uh, not to denounce uh, the Kurdish independence referendum. And yet t uh, President Erdogan is threatening to cut off uh, oil exports from Kurdistan if their independence drive goes further. Is this helpful? Would it be helpful, really, to cut off oil supplies from Kurdistan? I don't know. I cannot tell that. Everything that is happening inside a country is its domestic affair. Yesterday I talked to the newly appointed ambassadors of foreign countries to Russia, and I also mentioned the situation in Spain and Catalonia. I can say the same about Iraq. We are aware of uh, the sensitivity of uh, this issue for Turkey, Iran, for Syria. Because it's not only the situation inside Iraq, and we are aware of that. Uh, the, the issue is about the Kurdish situation in the region as a whole. We have good relations with the people, of, with the Kurdish people. We have historical ties, and we are not provoking anything. We are not pushing anyone to anything. We are not interfering in these processes. That is why our statements are very cautious and careful. They are not aimed at provoking and deteriorating the situation. Our aim is to ensure contacts aimed at coming up with mutually acceptable solutions. Regarding sanctions, well, I've discussed that already. I mentioned it. Everything depends on a specific situation. For the Kurds, nevertheless, oil is their lifeblood. Do you think you know, if, it, if the oil supply was cut off, it, really, it would hurt them massively? Do you think these threats from, from Erdogan are, are useful? I believe that it will have a good bearing on global energy markets. Prices are going to go up. But I don't think that there's anyone interested in that. One should study carefully the real situation. Any assumptions should not deteriorate the situation and provoke it. And turning to Iran, of course, there was a lot of talk that President Trump will pull out of the Iranian deal. And certainly when you talk to people in Tehran, there's almost an assumption um, in the Iranian government that somehow Trump, will, uh, the, the new US administration, uh, will find a way to, to pull out. If that happens, will you, uh, will you still support uh, the deal as the Europeans said they will? Can we make it work without the United States? Are you asking me? 
because, well, we have a number of speakers in the panel, well, so it's going to be a dialogue, after all. Well, you see, it's not Russia that defines or predetermines whether Iran is in compliance with its commitments. It is up to IAEA to verify it, to reconfirm that it is a reputable, globally recognized, specialized organization. And all IAEA reports attest to the fact that Iran is in full compliance with its commitments, and that's what we are guided by. And we're going to support the deal concluded with the participation of the previous U.S. administration, although we, as you know, had lots of differences uh, with them on many other issues. But as of now, all the countries are in compliance uh, with their commitments. Their deeds are fully in line with the relevant UNSC resolution, and we're going to support this deal. Turning, um, turning further afield now to North, North Korea, of course, is another uh, major story that's of, um, that's of, of key importance uh, to everybody um, in this room. Um, President Trump has used some extremely provocative language when it comes to uh, North Korea, even going so far um, as to threaten the country with annihilation during his UN speech um, a few weeks ago. President Putin, your, your good friend Dr. Kissinger might argue that Trump is deliberately appearing uh, to sound crazy in a way, to keep his opponents off balance. This is the, the famous madman theory. Um, other people just see chaos in US policy when it comes to North Korea. What do you think? What do you think of the president's approach? Well, you are an American. It is up to you. You are in better position to judge. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually Irish, so I'm completely neutral in all of this. <laughs> Is there anyone who could be completely neutral? Is it such a thing? Well, you're the first one whom I know to be completely neutral. No matter what happens, it's not up to me to assess the policy of the president of the U.S. Publicly, I mentioned that, and it's not a secret. I can just reiterate what I mentioned. Well, the rhetoric on all the sides uh, sh shouldn't be aggravating. There should be a direct dialogue between the U.S. and North Korea, between North Korea and the countries of the region. And that is the only way to ensure a balanced and acceptable solution to the issue. All other approaches lead to a dangerous deadlock. By the way, what, that's what have come to my mind just now, exactly now while I was talking about that. Everyone keeps mentioning the need to further step up sanctions against North Korea, but North Korea is a small country. It has been living under sanctions for many decades, and so what? In 2001, I believe it was in 2001, as I was traveling to Japan, I was in North Korea and met the father of uh, the current leader. Back then, he told me that they had a nuclear bomb. Back then, he, he, he mentioned that. It's true. Furthermore, he said that with the help of very unsophisticated artillery systems could even cover the distance up to Seoul, and it it was in 2001, and now it's 2018. The country is in the condition of constant sanctions. And instead of nuclear bomb, they have a hydrogen bomb. Instead of simple artillery systems, they have uh, long-range missiles covering the distance up to 5,000 kilometers. That's what has changed. Is it the way that will contribute to the solution of the problem? Well, quite the opposite is happening. And there was a moment when there was certain agreement reached with North Korea, when North Korea took, assumed certain commitments to stop its, its missile and nuclear programs. Well, instead, someone decided to freeze the accounts of North Korean banks because someone believed that the commitments that North Korea assumed were not sufficient enough and they should have, they should have done much more. But that's what they agreed. That was the agreement. 
Why did they provoke them? Why did they have to do that? After that, they were reformed from all their commitments. And now what we see is the development of their programs. We have a hydrogen bomb in addition to a missile bomb and multiple launch rocket systems, which are six to 70 kilometers of range. And no one knows where they're hiding them. And that's why this belligerent rhetoric is very dangerous. Uh, let's be completely frank. Is there a possibility of a prompt strike? Yes, there is such a possibility. Will it hit the target? Well, no one knows that for sure. No one, no one knows where, what they're keeping and where with 100% certainty. It is a closed country. That's the answer. But do you need such rhetoric after all? I don't think so. That is why meeting, uh, the meeting with President Trump, we mentioned that, and I told him exactly what I am telling you now. We had a discussion on that issue. I believe I've mentioned that, that President Trump, well, it's his first presidential term and he's gaining momentum. He's building up his experience in this field. And we had a dialogue on this issue. He, listens to what I'm saying, he listens to my arguments. Well, I know that everything that's happening in North Korea is quite irritating for them. We understand that. The, but uh, any actions aimed at undermining the NSC resolution compliance, we are condemning that. There is a Chinese-Russian initiative, a roadmap. If there's someone who is not supporting that, if they don't like that Russia and China put it forth, why don't we try to forget that it was Russia, Russia and China Chinese initiative? Let's well, call it differently, but what we need to stop is confrontation and uh, we need to find a way to a mutually acceptable solution. But you, you say that President Trump listens to you, but when you listen to his rhetoric in North Korea, that wouldn't seem to be the case. You're saying that we should de-escalate the situation, de-escalate the rhetoric, and yet with every single day that passes, his rhetoric seems to increase. Just two days ago, he very publicly said to Rex Tillerson, you know, forget about it. There's no point doing, there's no point even talking to the North Koreans. I'll deal with it. Are you sure that he's listening to you? Well, you know, since uh, we talked last time, some time has passed. The situation is evolving with every passing day. New irritating factors are emerging. There were new tests uh, by North Korea. Uh, nuclear bomb was tested, missiles were tested. Everything is changing. What Rex Tillerson stated, well, I, I'm not aware of everything. Well, I do know some things, but not all of them. You'd better ask them by yourself what they are discussing. Why would they comment on that? Well, I've been clear. Let's turn to a different question. I believe it would be more interesting for an audience present here anyways. I think I need one, one more follow-up on that, and I know deep down you, you love talking about the Russia relationship with, uh, with America. You said that um, you talked to Donald Trump about a lot of things, and he agrees with you on certain areas. Can you just give us a sense of how your relationship um, is developing? I know you met with him in, in Hamburg, but you know, in your conversations with him on the phone, can you give us a sense of what your personal relationship is like? Well, our personal relations, they're almost none. We saw each other just one time. Yes, we had a couple of telephone conversations on various issues of mutual interest. We also discussed uh, the Syrian issue. By the way, here we see eye to eye. Uh, on certain issues, we are cooperating with the Americans uh, on many tracks. Yes, there are certain problems, tensions, certain certain confrontation when our approaches are different, but still we are capable of coming to joint solutions uh, to coordinate our approaches. Well, regarding interstate relations, well, you can judge by yourself. They have become hostage to the internal political situation in the US. I've mentioned that on many occasions. Certain forces are using Russian-American relations to address their internal political problems. Well, we are passionate, we are waiting 
for this process, internal political process of the US to come to an end. I do hope that the fundamental mutual interests, which are not proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, the combating of cyber crime, our cooperation in the energy field, uh, our cooperation in the area of addressing regional conflicts. I've been working tirelessly on those conflicts, on the coming up with a solution to those conflicts, as in Syria, for example, the fight against terrorism, cybercrime. Well, I believe these are fundamental interests that will change the nature of Russian-American relations for the better. But do you think, just getting back to what you said a moment ago, do you think that Donald Trump has become a hostage of the American political system? That seems to be what you just said. Well, I believe that such a personality as Trump, with his character, will never be hostage to anyone. So what would your advice to him be? Well, I, uh, as a, an electorate, member of electorate, why don't you give him your advice? Why would I do that? I'm advised by my electorate, and I believe that President of the US should be advised by his electorate. You are among them. So as an advice, uh, you can formulate your own position, your own advice on your behalf or on behalf of a group of citizens, on a group of a party, on a group of uh, business community. I am confident that business community would advise him to establish normal economic ties with Russia in order to prevent competitors taking profitable positions at the Russian market and to work jointly in the interests of American economy. There are such companies, uh, there are quite many of them. By the way, at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum this summer, American companies uh, were very abundant. You know, there are lots of real friends that are interested in establishing well-established, full-fledged cooperation. We will continue promoting ties with them, irrespective of uh, the current uh, political situation. And, ha and has President Trump told you that he, that he personally wants to re-establish normal business ties between Russia and the US? Why don't you ask him? I cannot tell you everything he, he told me. Do you want me to tell everything to you? That would be good. That would be nice if you could. Um, briefly, getting back to North... That would be bad. It will be a bad thing, for sure. I'm a journalist. I need to ask these questions. <laughs> um, briefly, getting back to um, North Korea. So you, President um, Putin, you're, you, know, you are one of the you know, you are the senior figure on the international stage. You've been, you, of all of the major countries, you've been around for, for the longest. And I know North Korea is an extremely difficult country to analyze from the outside. How do you analyze the stability of the regime? Do you, is that something you worry about? Is that something that you think about? There's so little we know about how North Korea works. How stable do you think the regime is? Those who are trying to talk to North Korea using the use of force, they are making the Korean regime stronger. That is a brief answer to your question. Okay. And uh, we read this week that North Korea now has a second route to the internet, and that goes, um, the first one was through China, and they now have a, a route to the internet uh, via Russia. Is that the right signal to send to North Korea after their repeated violations of, of, of UN resolutions? Do you intend to allow the second route to the internet to remain open? What kind of route are you talking about? A connection, like an internet connection. Послушайте, connection. У нас общая граница. We have a common border. The nuclear test field is 200 kilometers far from the Russian border. It is located on the North Korean territory. We're highly concerned about that. We're even more concerned about that than you. Regarding our trade and economic ties, well, I mentioned that publicly, there are almost none. They're almost non-existent. We supply 40 million tons of oil 
per quarter, as I believe, compared to 400 million tons shipped to other foreign markets. If that's so, I believe it's 400 million. Indeed, 400 million tons of oil are being shipped to foreign markets and 40,000 to the market of North Korea. Not a single vertically integrated company in Russia supplies anything to it. These are just local supplies, small scale companies. We don't even know them, but it's almost nothing. That is why there is not a, s a route you are talking about around a couple of thousands of uh, North Korean uh, citizens are working in our country who have relatives there. That's it. That's almost nothing. Almost no cooperation. There is nothing to discuss. There is no route you are talking about. So, President Putin, let's talk a little bit about your legacy as pre President of Russia, the Russian economy. Um, and, its, and, and its future. I think these are questions that... Uh, I'll tell you a joke about an Israeli army. <laughs> a young soldier was asked, see, just imagine, there are 20 terrorists are going at you. I will take a Nuzi machine gun, I'll start firing back. All right, and so if there are tanks, I will take the grenade throw and I will try and defend myself and if there are you know airplanes flying and the tanks are rolling and the terrorists and says uh, Mr. General am I alone in this whole army and so am I alone on this panel well, I promise I promise I will I, I will bring bring in the others in, in a moment um, but you know we have elections here um, in March um, and you know, as you know, the economy is the Russian economy um, is showing some is showing some signs of recovery. There was a, a measure of competitiveness recently showed that Russia has risen, I think, five places. So it's now sort of roughly um, around the same level as where Poland and um, and Spain are. On the other hand, if you look at surveys of wealth disparities um, in Russia, you see that you know Russia is more divided economically than it has been uh, since you became president, and the gap between the rich and the poor is, is the most extreme of any major country. Do you see this as the biggest failure of your presidency? This is not um, as much as a failure, but rather a trend in the development of the Russian economy and as far as the social area is concerned, because we're indeed going through a uh, process of recovery, and this is not a good trend, and I'm going to speak about it. And this is something that appeared not yesterday or today. It came about from the very start of the 1990s when the Soviet uh, social security system became dismantled and uh, the market relations uh, took off, uh, which were the result of the shock therapy. That's the genesis. Now the recovery is indeed underway, and we are currently observing a sustainable economic uh, growth in Q4 last year that was 0.3%. In Q1 this year, 0.5%, and uh, currently in the third quarter, in the second quarter, it was already 2.5 percent. Per 1.9 percent industrial output grew. We see very strong growth into the fixed asset base, and we are also registering positive uh, trading balance. Well, I, I'm not going to throw too much of uh, statistics at you um, um, so as to avoid mixing things up, but in absolute uh, figures, I would believe about 180 billion US dollars is uh, we've got a positive. Uh, Andre, is it 180? Uh, the current account? Uh, how much? 130. There's the current account. Uh, but the positive. So I think it's about 100 billion, even more than that. So as I said, we see indirect investments growing into uh, fixed assets. And that is against the backdrop of the 
lowest historical level of inflation, 3% inflation we're currently having, and the record low unemployment, 5%. The golden currency reserves in the central bank are growing somewhere at the level of 400 billion right now. Yes, and I forgot to mention, the real income is recovering, which is really making me feel happy. The real income is recovering. Now, in terms of this delta, you know, this difference uh, between uh, the well-to-dos and the poor ones, this is a real problem that is uh, something that we're really going to work on. But here you also find certain things without mentioning which we wouldn't enjoy being able to see the full picture. Now, what do I mean by this? Starting from uh, the year 2000, the correlation between, I mean, not rather the correlation, but uh, the number of people who live uh, below the poverty line started changing. Almost 40% of people in the year 2000 were below the poverty line, about 38% to be more exact. Currently, that has dramatically changed. During the previous two years, this relationship were changed a little bit for the worse, but currently it is improving, and there is no doubt that we need to change a lot in our social security policy. And uh, what I mean by this is that one should create a system whereby the government help is going to be very specifically and purposefully provided to those individuals and to those categories who are in real need of it, rather evenly to everybody is what we're currently seeing in the social security as a sector. So that is the situation. We are aware of these issues and these problems and we understand what uh, has to be done in order to improve it. Fi finally, President Putin, that, sound, that sounds a little bit like a campaign speech. Have you decided yet whether you're going to run again? It's still the question that everyone is waiting for. No, not yet. I haven't uh, made up my mind against who I'm going to run, and I haven't decided whether I'm going to run at all, because uh, by the law, I think it's uh, in the end of November, beginning of December, uh, the election, presidential election campaign is going to be officially announced. By that point in time, I believe that uh, the main contenders will publicly come out and state their intention and as well as their election programs. Thank you. Well, I, I promised I would bring in the other members of the panel. So as a quick uh, roundup, because I think we're at the end of our time now, I would like to ask our three energy, our three industry um, experts to answer two quick questions uh, for the benefit of this audience. The first question is, where do you see the optimal price of oil for your industry? And the second question is, in what year or in what decade do you think that global demand for fossil fuels will peak? And I'll start with you, Mr. Amin, at the end. I will never uh, make that prediction because there are much better qualified people to make predictions on the price of oil. Um, I think that the world of energy is changing. We talked about some of the global things, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things about the Russian experience, which, which I've seen. Briefly, because I think very we're briefly, out we, of time. We, since we're yeah. in Russian Energy yeah. Week, is that I found it really quite impressive to look at the capacity they have in research and development and scientific capability. President Putin mentioned the competitiveness of Russia on solar modules. I've met with young researchers in the Moscow State University who are pioneering new thin film research on panels that have the potential of dramatically increasing the efficiency and reducing the price. I think the challenge is how do you commercialize this kind of research and how do you go to market in a commercial sense. But I think the second uh, part of this is, you know, we've been engaged in a discussion with uh, uh, Minister Alexander Novak and his colleagues and experts on what potential pathways there are for Russia. And it's very exciting to see in just one year, we have the first two gigawatt wind auction. We have retrofitting of uh, uh, factories to produce wind turbines in Russia. And we have just announcement of three major uh, solar PV investments that have, are coming on stream. So I think, you know, even to see in a large uh, uh, economy, which is based on hydrocarbons, like in Russia, that the potential for renewables is coming. So I, th I think my last point on that would be, it's not a question of competition between one source or another. It's a question of which solution makes sense in terms of technology, cost, and economic viability at any particular time. And I think from that point of view, we're going to see a healthy mix in the future. Mr. Hussain Adali, very briefly. 
Well, about the oil, I leave it to uh, Mr. Barkindu to talk about the oil price. But uh, on uh, the matter of uh, peaking uh, the fossil fuel, I would say that the world actually is moving towards having more resilience and um, resilience by having more diversification. So this is why actually we would see the world and many countries would like to diversify the energy mix. This is why I think that the fossil fuel, the uh, share of the fossil fuel would uh, diminish, would uh, reduce, but not to the extent that uh, some people may think. For the time being, the combined share of uh, oil, gas, and coal is something around 85% of the energy mix. And in the next 25 years, under the basic scenario of many forecasters, whether exporters or importers, it is going to come down to something around 70%. So still, it would be a dominant, a quite major and dominant for, uh, fuel of the, of the world. But even under the various kind of scenarios, which we have seen under the scenario of 450 degrees of IEA, it comes to something uh, uh, around 60%. So still we see that the fossil fuel would be dominant. But in this, I, should, I would like to take this opportunity to say that gas would be the fastest growing one. Actually, gas would gain and uh, coal would lose, would be the, the, the major loser. And of course, uh, the share of oil also would be reduced. Mr. Barkindo, briefly. In the opening address of President Putin, he did make a reference to the nearly two billion people in this planet today who have no access uh, to energy. And the vast majority of these two billion live in the South, in the developing world of Africa, Asia, and South America. Therefore, the issue of energy poverty will continue to be on the top agenda of not only uh, energy producing countries like OPEC and Russia, but the consuming countries as a whole. In addition to that, in our focus, in our outlook to 2040, the OPEC world oil outlook, we estimate nearly 2 billion additional people will come into this world by the year 2040. In addition to the current 2 billion that have no access uh, to energy, these 2 billion, vast majority, will also come from developing countries. Therefore, the issue of peak demand for oil in particular and peak demand for energy in general uh, is not seen in our focus uh, for the foreseeable future to 2040. This world will continue to need energy. Uh, of course, we are moving into a transition, but as the president also said, this transition has to be all inclusive. It has to take into account those who are deprived the right to have access uh, to energy, those who are currently in deficit, and those who will join this planet in year 2040. And as you know very well, John, as a matter of policy, uh, we are not in the business of forecasting prices as such in OPEC, but we remain consistent on the issue of attaining stability in the oil markets on a sustainable basis in the interest of all producers, in the interest of all consumers, primarily to ensure predictable and sustainable energy investments uh, to ensure that future supplies are guaranteed uh, to continue to fuel growth, not only in the developed countries, but also in the poor developing countries. And I would like to use this opportunity once again to thank the Russian Federation who have consistently uh, stayed together with developing countries, be it in the issue of climate change, issues of sustainable development, issues of energy poverty, the climate change framework as we know it today, the Framework Convention of Climate Change, would not have been possible without the collaboration of the Russian Federation, OPEC, and the developing countries. And 
number of our countries, almost all our OPEC member countries have already uh, signed up to the Paris Agreement. Uh, several of them are already in the process of ratification. So despite the fact that we have oil producing and exporting countries, we are also mindful of the fact that we remain citizens of this world. Our countries are impacted by climate change. Uh, we are also impacted by the response measures of the rich industrialized countries. Yet we remain responsible uh, for our destiny and therefore we are joining the rest of the world uh, in ensuring that we fulfill uh, the objectives uh, of the Climate Change Convention going forward. Thank you. President Putin, I'll give you the final word. As I said, and I would like to repeat, I am confident this is an obvious fact, that uh, the need for energy resources would only grow, and this applies both to the hydrocarbons and to the renewables, but the hydrocarbons will be in demand uh, in the course of many decades to come. And yet again, I would like to underscore that the need to utilize hydrocarbons is going to be obvious and will going, will, will is going to become stronger. And the situation in the global markets will depend upon a well-weighted, balanced approach by the producing countries. But our recent agreement with the OPEC countries and with the other countries which produce energy resources but which are not OPEC members does demonstrate that such agreement is possible. And that is exactly the kind of responsible way that Russia is going to demonstrate in the future. And uh, in my mind, we have all the reasons to believe that the situation in the global energy market in the foreseeable future will remain in a balanced state. With that, thank you everyone here today for coming and listening. Thank you to our, our panelists, Mr. Burkindo, Mr. Adeli, Mr. Uh, Mr. Amim, and most of all, thank you to our host, President Vladimir Putin. Thank you.